Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Carleton University. Welcome to the Canada India Center for Excellence in Science, Technology, Trade, and Policy. And welcome to the inaugural lecture of the center sponsored by Barj Dahan. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here and to introduce you to Mr. Dahan. There is a saying that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And it's a great saying. Some people think it was Newtonian that the, you know, the apple and gravity falling close to the tree. But the meaning of this, the, the sentence is that it's the son is like his father. And I must say that it is a great privilege to know Mr. Dehan. Uh, he has talked often about his father and about his father's charitable work. Um, Mr. Dahan himself was born in India, came to Canada, and has followed in his father's footsteps, setting up nursing schools, setting up secondary schools in India. He truly believes in education. Thousands of young people have graduated from school 3,000 nurses, um, practical nurses and uh, uh, midwifing nurses have graduated from his nursing school and soon his medical school will continue serving a great need in India. He is also someone who truly believes in the diaspora and the role of Canadian Indians or Indo-Canadians in Canada. And he believes in the power of democracy the power of education, and the power of us all to change the world. And by funding this lecture, he created for us the opportunity to increase our knowledge, to increase our wisdom by learning from a truly wise person. So it is now my pleasure to remind you that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And you know that came from Cervantes and Don Quixote, uh, 16th century. People were thinking already then of the importance of one's traditions and one's parentage. But it happened even before that. Uh, Morotake, the Japanese poet, wrote a haiku. And he said, as the uh, cherry falls from the tree, it will soon, uh, the cherry flower falls from the tree, it will come back as a butterfly. And at Carleton University, we have a butterfly exhibit. And the butterfly exhibit is about the ephemeral beauty of life. It's about nature and preserving what we have. It's about sustainability. And I think the traditions that Mr. Dehan respects, the fact that he cares so sincerely about the education and health of Canadians and Indians is an indication to us all that he has contributed to our moment of beauty and our ongoing sustainable uh, existence. So Mr. Dehan, would you please come to the microphone and talk to us? Dr. Rante, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Deputy High Commissioner of India, Mrs. Narinder Chohan, distinguished guests, dignitaries, friends, students, learners. It's a very honored uh, experience today to be here at Carleton University as part of Canada-India Center for Excellence and to be able to have the 11th president of India deliver this inaugural lecture in recognition of my father and my mother's, mother's work. Neither of them could be here. They're both in their 80s. My father is launching another health and education center complex in Punjab, so he could not come and he sends his regrets. My mother says, son, I have too many aches and pains to travel to Ottawa, but go have a good time. A uh, few years ago, my father was honored with a doctorate degree from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia for his work. My father wanted my help on writing his speech in English. So as we were working on this, for the first time, he shared something that was very personal to him. 
he said that he wanted to go to school. He had gone up to grade eight. He wanted to continue. But my grandfather and my grandfather's brother, they decided no. They were not going to spend more money on sending my father to school. But my father's uncle, he was quite a religious man involved in India's independence movement and also involved in the revival within Sikhism that was taking place. So my, my father's uncle wanted my father to become a granthi, meaning a priest. So he was taken to a Sikh religious institution for learning, but 100, 150 kilometers away from our home. My, my, my father said he lasted two weeks and then decided to walk back home. He didn't receive a very good welcome, but my grandparents didn't say anything to him. That, he says, became one of the defining moments in his life and his life's mission and purpose. On, on one of Mother's Days a few years ago, my sister, my eldest sister who is here with me, we took my mother out for Mother's Day dinner to a Punjabi restaurant. And I asked my mother, I said, you know, if God came to you today and said, Kashmir Kaur, I'm going to give you another lifetime. What would you say and what would you do? She piped up and she said, first of all, I would not marry, and secondly, I would get an education. <laughs> so my father often says that he came to Canada to provide an opportunity for my sisters. I have four sisters. I am the only son in the family, though I was not favored. Uh, he said he came here to give his children, an opportunity to go to school, go to college, and go to university. And we all have. And during growing up years, my mother often used to say to my sisters and I, look, I never had an opportunity to go to education, to, to, school, to school, but you have. So work hard, learn. And the learning and the purpose of going to school and learning is not simply to get a good job at the end, but it is to serve your community, your country, your society. So through that, we do create a better and prosperous and peaceful, equitable, just world. During the mid-1970s, my father used to talk about someday, after my younger sister graduates, he said, from high school, to return to India and establish a medical college. Well, when he landed down there, first of all, the, the ground reality is very different. Very few people were supportive of this idea. Somebody said, do a feasibility study. My father said, if we do a feasibility study, it'll never happen. So lo and behold, a project was launched, and um, we ended up establishing school, hospital, um, nursing programs, and then one of the things my father always said, he said what he wants to do through this initiative in India was to link Canada and India and to become a bridge between these two wonderful countries, home place and adopted home. Both countries were Indians, were Punjabis, were Sikhs, were Canadians. And he said, I want to link the two nations together through education and make education a way of doing high-level diplomacy. University of British Columbia became a partner with us, the longest-running nursing degree program in Commonwealth countries. And through that partnership, many more partnerships have emerged. So we're really glad that, in a way, what my parents wanted to do, that what we were able to benefit here by coming to Canada, now we could give something back to India but also to give to Canada. So everything that my parents have taught me and have been doing and we've been doing is all about Canada first and India first. It's, it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. Um, my father described his mission as promoting meaningful change within rural India by uplifting young women through professional qualification that would directly benefit themselves and the people with the highest need. 
He recognized that by elevating the professional stature of nursing education and making nursing education accessible to families who would not ordinarily access university training, a society could be created that could sustain even its weakest members. In Punjab, in northern India, nursing was not a high status profession because under India's traditional philosophy, the caste system, what is clean and unclean, nursing was at the lowest rung. And it was also associated with the Christian missionary movement. So in Punjab, there were only two nursing degree granting institutions for a, for a population of 20 or 25 million. While in Canada, we had one de degree granting institution for every million people. That's the kind of the gap there was. So our center became the third. Today, what you see in Punjab now is that you will see matrimonial ads. Canadian, American, British parents of Indian ancestry, they go looking for young women for their sons. And in the matrimonial ads, the ads read, want young Punjabi, beautiful, tall, nurse, preferably graduated from Tahankhlera Nursing School. <laughs> I think what my parents have done and are doing was that they realized the value of education and global citizenship. And this is really what myself, my sisters, we wanted to honor my parents work that way by establishing the annual DeHaan Lecture at Canada India Center for Excellence at Carleton University. It happens to be our capital city, and I'm really grateful to Dr. Ronche, Your Excellency, to be here, and every one of you to come and join us for the first lecture. I think I'd just like to conclude with a few words that my father shared with, um, in a study, in a book, a PhD dissertation that came out last year called Canadian Punjabi Philanthropy and its Impact on Punjab, a Sociological Study. In it, my father is quoted as expressing his values and the source of his inspiration. He said, honest work creates healthy family and community. Sharing with others, caring for the poor and needy, seeking justice, living with gratitude to God, and working together in a community are the things that bring health and prosperity for all. And that is all. Prosperity for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very uplifting, Barch, and you didn't fall off the stage, so good, don't follow my example. Uh, it is now my privilege to introduce to you Her Excellency, uh, the High Commissioner of India, Mrs. Chohan, who will introduce our speaker. Mrs. Chohan. Thank you, Dr. Runte and Burji, distinguished guests. This is quite tall. It's an honor and privilege for me to welcome you to the first Dahan Lecture. This evening's lecture is by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. How should I describe him? A scientist, an administrator, an author, a humanist, an educationist, my fellow civil servant, and above all, a statesman. Awul Pakir Janul Abdeen Abdul Kalam born 15 October 1931, makes him almost 81 years young today. Raised in Rameshwaram, Tamil Nadu, he studied physics and specialized in aerospace engineering from the Madras Institute of Technology, Chennai. Dr. Kalam worked as an aerospace engineer with the Defense Research Development Organization, the DRDO, and the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. These, both these institutions are the crown corporations of the government of India. Very soon, Dr. Kalam earned popularity as the missile man of India for his work on the development of ballistic missile, including Agni and Prithvi, 
and for the development of launch vehicle technology, which made India a member of the exclusive space club. It was only natural that the government of India honored him with the Padma Bhushan in 1981 and the Padma Vibhushan in 1990 for his work with both these organizations and also for his role as a principal scientific advisor to the government of India. We, as young civil servants, we often had the honor to meet him in the corridors and the elevators of our offices which we shared in the humongous South Block in New Delhi. In the year 1997, Dr. Kalam received India's highest civilian honor, the Bharat Ratna, for his immense and invaluable contribution to the scientific research and modernization of defense technology in India. In 2002, Dr. Kalam was elected as the president of India, the highest office in our country, which he occupied till 2007. Dr. Kalam continued to interact with students during his term as the president and also during his post-presidency period as a visiting professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, Indian Institute of Management, Indore, and as the chancellor of Indian Institute of Space, Science, and Technology, Thiruvananthapuram. Dr. Kalam is known for his motivational and inspiring speeches and interaction with the student community. Dr. Kalam has met more than 15 million youth in his own words. I feel comfortable in the company of young people, particularly students. I intend to share with them experiences, helping them to ignite their imagination. Dr. Kalam was nominated for the MTV Youth Icon of the Year Award in 2003 and again in 2006. Even a film has been made on him, and the film's name is I Am Kalam, where Dr. Kalam is portrayed as an extremely positive influence to a poor but bright young boy from Rajasthan named Chotu, who renames himself Kalam in honor of his idol. Last year, in 2011, Dr. Kalam launched his mission for the youth of the nation called What Can I Give Movement? with a central theme to defeat corruption. It is therefore only apt that Dr. Kalam delivers his lecture from the ramparts of a university. Ladies and gentlemen, India values its relations with Canada, which have never been as close as these are today. Sustained as these are, by close cooperation in every aspect of human endeavor. It is in this spirit, I consider it a special privilege for me that my former president speaks from the platform of the National Canada India Center of Excellence, a project which was initiated by me personally to forge policy linkages between our two countries. I am grateful for the presence today of those leading lights of Indian diaspora from across Canada who helped me walk the talk. I am grateful to Dr. Runte, Dr. Fenn Hampson, Dr. Elliot Tepper, Dr. Randy Zadra, and other faculty members of the university for their consistent support in helping us realize this vision. We look forward to Dr. Kalam's guidance on how to steer the course of the center further. The government of India has gifted an endowed chair to the center. The incumbent has been selected and we will be joining next semester. In his book, India 2020, Dr. Kalam strongly advocates an action plan to develop India into a knowledge superpower and a developed nation by the year 2020. Books authored by Dr. Kalam have received international acclaim, and there is a huge demand for their translated versions from all across the world, including from South Korea. He also has interests in writing poetry and in playing veena, a South Indian string instrument. Dr. Kalam continues to take an active interest in various developments in the field of science and technology. He has proposed a research program for developing bio implants. He has proposed, he is also a supporter of open source over proprietary solutions and believes that the use of free software on a large scale will bring the benefits of information technology to more people. 
It is no surprise that 43 leading universities of the world have conferred honorary doctorate on Dr. Kalam. On October 5, that is two days from now, the Simon Fraser University of Canada will confer on him his 44th. If I were to list all his achievements and the publications to his credit, it would take me a whole day. I'll suffice it to say, and I'll conclude by saying that as the president of India, Dr. Kalam left an indelible print on the course of internal and external policies of our government. Dr. Kalam gave to us the concept of pura. The word pura in Hindi symbolically means complete. In other words, self-sufficient. The acronym PURA, providing urban amenities to rural areas, connects a group of village clusters so that they become economically viable units, leading to the social and economic upliftment of people residing in those clusters, thereby encouraging reverse migration from cities. Dr. Kalam's vision continues to inspire the inclusive growth policies of the government of India till today. Was this also not the vision of Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation, whose birth anniversary the whole world celebrated yesterday, and whose statue finds its pride of place in this very campus with the Ottawa River flowing by? Ladies and gentlemen, India had missed the Industrial Revolution, but made the jump start to the Digital Revolution. India has always been ready to share its experiences with fellow developing countries in the spirit of true partnership. In my former capacity as the Director General for African Affairs in my Foreign Office, I had the privilege of experiencing firsthand the enormous love and affection that Dr. Kalam has for fellow developing countries, countries with which India shares the pains of post-colonial reconstruction and development. It was the vision of Dr. Kalam that gave to our brothers and sisters in Africa the gift of India's Pan-African e-network project. Under this project, the premier educational institutions of different countries of sub-Sahara Africa, their leading medical and hospitals have been connected with their counterpart centers of excellence in India to provide to our brothers and sisters in Africa the advantages of tele-education and telemedicine. I had the proud privilege of translating my president's vision into action on the ground. The vision and the scale of India's Pan-African e-network project is historic and unprecedented. This vision was given to us by none other than Dr. Kalam, who I now invite to speak, and the subject is the birth of an enlightened society. Ladies and gentlemen, I now request you to please rise to welcome my former president and your very own Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Uh, please sit down, please. Uh, good evening to all of you, friends. I would like to greet Dr. Rosan Trunde, President of Carlton University, and uh, Mrs. Narendra Chawa, the High Commissioner of India, Vijay Lakshman, and Baj Dahan. And uh, because of him, we have all assembled here. Uh, friends, I am indeed delighted to visit Carton University and deliver the Dahan lecture and interact with the students and faculty members and Indo-Canadian community members and distinguished guests. My greetings to the Dahan family for their philanthropic education and societal transformation activities in Canada and India, and I greet the Canada-India Centre for Excellence in Science, Technology, Trade and Policy and Carlton University for hosting this lecture. I am very happy to be in the campus of Carlton University 
which is known for its strength in a variety of fields like engineering, humanities, international business, journalism, political science, and public policy, and administration, and legal studies. I would like to congratulate the Carleton University for the academic excellence and standing in the nation and the world. The university has made its mark in the realm of innovation and has generated specialists in engineering, arts, politics, law, and many other fields. The creative and interdisciplinary approach to the research at Carleton University has led to many significant creative works in science and technology, business, governance, public policy, and the arts. When I am in the midst of such a renowned university, full of young research and the entrepreneurial minds who would be transformers of tomorrow, I would like to share my thoughts on the theme, birth of, birth of enlightened society. Birth of enlightened society, that's the topic for next 20 minutes I will be discussing with you. Now friends, I start like this. Dear friends, when I studied in Canada, when I studied the Canadian history, I find that in 1867, with the union of three British North American colonies through Confederation, Canada was formed as a federal dominion of four provinces. During the same period, in 1857, India started the freedom movement, and we got the freedom 1947. Nearly during the last 150 years, the dynamics of the world is full of hope, one side, and series of concern on the other. During this period, we have witnessed two world wars, hundreds of battles between and among societies, and also birth of more than 123 democratic nations being freed from foreign dominations. A world body called United Nations has been constituted with the Security Council. In the midst of conflicts between nations, it is reassuring to see the evolution of European Parliament integrating 27 European nations who were waging war against each other for over a century. Great events in the history which have happened in Asia is the birth of the Republic of China and the Republic of India. Both these republics have their own way of life. Of course, the subcontinent went through a great turmoil before the freedom. Similarly, in the Middle East region, a new nation, Israel, is born in the midst of war. There is a tendency seen in different regions in the world. Nations are desiring to come together for economic development of the region and promoting peace and prosperity. That is how Asia and SARC are born on the lines of European Union. However, there is a need for these cooperation to get strengthened further through an institutional mechanism. Another star which appears in front of us, women empowerment taking place in democratic countries, both at the helm of political leadership and parliament. Still, we have a long way to go. In history, we have seen how the slavery has been a curse, and a person like Abraham Lincoln entered into the scene, and the midst of conflict and war, USA was born. But Lincoln was assassinated. In India, a new experiment started by Mahatma Gandhi in 1930s, in the Ahimsa Dharma, that is peaceful non-cooperation movement. Not only resulted in India's attaining its freedom, but the cause of freedom for many nations. Similarly, in Africa, the apartheid system, which was present for centuries, was eliminated due to the sacrifice of person like Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for over 26 years. In short, during the last 150 years, we have seen how world of nations have recovered from wars and have been successful in generating peace at least in certain regions. Slavery has been abolished. Democratic institutions have started working. The use of science and technology through humane enterprises have started improving the lifestyle of society. Large number of people have moved over to the electricity from the kerosene lamp. Instant worldwide communication with audio video has become possible. Transportation speeds have increased phenomenally. 
and the world wide web has made the world a single unit. In spite of all the good side which I have presented, we are aware that the world is still faced with the pressing problem of conflict of civilization arising out of language, religion, cultural disparities, poverty encompassing around half the population of the world, shortage of water for 50 percent of population of the world and a large part of population suffering from new diseases and most importantly planet earth being in the grip of climate change phenomena, climate change phenomena due to indiscriminate use of fossil fuel. Now I am going to talk to you a vision for a peaceful and prosperous world, peaceful and prosperous world. In this environment of conflicts, I am asking myself in the presence of such a enlightened audience in Catherine campus, can we collectively make it possible in every part of the world, people living in a green environment without pollution, having prosperity without poverty, a peace without fear of war and a happy place to the live, to the live lives of for all citizens of the world. This is the theme of the talk. Friends, I am going to present a research solution based on my lectures to multiple universities in India and abroad and working on number of projects with youth of the nations. We have generated a treatise called Evolution of a World Enlightened Citizen, Evolution of World Enlightened Citizen. I am inspired by the words of Swami Vivekananda. He said, God is present in every jiva, every life. There is no other God beside that who serves jiva, serves God indeed. For achieving this, what we need is a carrier of eternal goodness among all human beings with wholesome human contact. And this is the righteousness in the heart, a hymn which I have heard in a spiritual center. It goes like this. Where there is a righteousness, righteousness in the heart, there is beauty in the character. Where there is beauty in the character, there is harmony in the home. Where there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. Where there is order in the nation, there is peace in the world. So, friend, this is true for the whole world. When we need peace in the world, we need order in the nation. We need harmony in the home. Whichever part of the world, the origin is righteousness in the heart. How do you evolve righteousness in the heart for every citizen of the world? That is the starting point of evolution of enlightened citizens of the world. Evolution of a enlightened society. Friends, I would like to put forth to this important gathering a methodology for evolving a happy, prosperous and peaceful society in our planet, which I call it evolution of a world enlightened citizens. How do we create such a enlightened citizen? It can be achieved through a three dimensional approach, namely education with value system, religion transformed into spirituality, this is tough but it has to be done, economic development for societal transformation. Let us discuss education with value system. We have seen that the seeds of peace in the world have their origin in the righteousness in the heart of every individual. Such righteousness citizens lead to the evolution of a enlightened society. The education value system has been so designed that the righteousness in the heart is developed in young minds. That should be the mission of education. The prime learning environment is to fight to 17 years of age. This reminds me of an ancient Greek teacher saying, give me a child, give me a child for seven years. Afterwards, let God or devil take the child, they cannot change the child. This indicates the power of great teachers and what they can inculcate in the young minds. Parents and teachers must inculcate moral leadership among the children. It requires the ability to have insight into the uniqueness and the universality of the human consciousness. True education is the acquisition of enlightened feelings and enlightened power to understand daily events and to understand the permanent truth linking man to his environment human and planetary. While I was in a college long, long ago, many of you are not in idea form, 1950s, when I was in college, I remember the lectures given by the highest authority of a Jesuit institution, Reverend Father Rector Kalatel. 
of St. Joseph's College, Trichinopoly, Southern India. Every week on Monday, the father rector will come, will take a class for an hour. He used, he, used, he used to talk about good human beings, present and past, and what makes good human beings. In this class, he used to give lectures on personalities such as Buddha, Confucius, Saint Augustine, Khalifa Omar, Mahatma Gandhi, Einstein, Abraham Lincoln, and moral stories linked to our civilizational heritage. In the moral science class, Reverend Father Kalantil used to highlight the best aspect of how the great personalities have been evolved as a good human beings through parental care, teaching, and championship of the great books. Even though these lessons were given to me in 1950s, during my college days, they inspire me even today. It is essential that in the schools and colleges, lectures are given by great teachers of the institution once in a week for one hour on civilizational heritage and derived value system. This may be called as a moral science class that will elevate the young mind to love the country, to love the other human beings, and to elevate them to higher planes. Members participating in this event today may like to consider evolving a system that would enable our youth to imbibe these fundamental traits for the benefit of all. Now let me take up the area that is transforming religion into a spiritual force. I would like to share an experience that I have witnessed myself, which has convinced me that it is possible. Many of them say it is not possible, but I am going to give an experience how it was possible. Now religion has two components, theology and spirituality. Even though theology is unique to every religion, the spiritual component spreads the value to be inculcated by the human beings for promoting good human life, welfare of the society while pursuing the material life. I would like to share an experience how the religion and science came together in a big mission in southern part of India. It was, it was during early 1960s. The founder of Indian Space Research, uh, pro Research Program, Professor Vikram Sarabhai, who is the father of the, the space program, with his team had located a place technically most suited for space research after considering many alternatives. The place called Tumba in Kerala was selected for space research as it was near the magnetic equator, ideally suited to, for ionospheric and electrojet research in upper atmosphere. I was fortunate to work with Professor Vikram Sarabhai for about eight years. The major challenge for Professor Vikram Sarabhai was to get the place in a specific area, that is Tumba area. As was normal, Professor Vikram Sarabhai approached Kerala government administrators, administrators first. After seeing the profile of the land and the sea coast, the view expressed was that thousands of fishing people live there. The place had an ancient St. Mary church, bishop's house, and a school. Hence, it would be very difficult to give this land, and they were willing to provide land in an alternative area. Similarly, the political system also opinioned, the chief minister and all opinion, that it would be a very difficult situation due to the existence of important institution and the concern for people who had to be relocated. However, there was one suggestion from the chief minister, he suggested to approach the only person who could advise and help, that was Bishop Reverend Father Peter Bernard Pereira. I was there with him at that time. Professor Vikram Sarabhai approached the bishop on a Saturday evening, and still I still remember the meeting between the two turned out to be historical. Many of witnessed the event, many of us witnessed the event. Reverend Father exclaimed, Oh Vikram, Vikram. He said, Vikram Sarabhai, oh Vikram, you are asking my children's abode, my abode, my God's abode, how is it possible? But we both had the unique quality, that the unique quality was in difficult time, both of them can smile. Reverend Father Peter Bernard Pereira asked Professor Vikram Sarabhai to come to the church on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Professor Vikram Sarabhai uh, went to the church again on Sunday with his team. At that time, the prayer was progressing, Sunday prayer was progressing, 
with a recitation Bible by Father Perida. After the prayer was over, the bishop invited Professor Vikram Sarabhai to come to the dais. The Reverend Father introduced Professor Vikram Sarabhai to the mass, thousands of people of local area. Dear children, here is a scientist, Professor Vikram Sarabhai. What science do? All of us experience, including the church, the light from the electricity. I am able to talk to you through the mic which is made possible by technology. The treatment to patients by doctors comes from medical sciences. Science through technology enhances the comfort and quality of human life. What I do as a preacher, what I do as a preacher, I pray for you, for your well-being, for your peace. In short, what Vikram is doing, what I am doing are the same. Both science and spirituality seek the Almighty's blessing for human one-side prosperity in body and mind. Dear children, that is Peter Perera, Reverend Father Peter Perera said, Dear children, Professor, Professor Vikram says he would build within a year near the sea coast, alternate sea coast, alternative facilities, what we are having. Now, dear children, can we give our abode? Can we give my abode? Can we give the God's abode for a great scientific mission? There was a total silence like what you are holding now, a pin drop silence. Then all of them got up and said, Amen, which made the whole church reverberate. Friends, that was the church. We had our design center where we started rocket design, rocket development, rocket assembly. And the bishop house was our scientist working place. Later, Tumba Equatorial Launching Station led to the establishment of Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. And the space act activity transformed the multiple space centers throughout the country. Now, this church has become an important center of learning where thousands of people learn about the dynamics of history of the space program of India and the great minds of scientists and spiritual leaders. Of course, the Tumba citizen got the well-equipped facilities, worshipping place and the educational center in an alternate place at the right time. When I think of this event, I see how enlightened spiritual and scientific leaders can converge towards giving reverence to the human life. Of course, the birth of Turles and Vikram Sarabhai Space Center gave the country the capacity for launch vehicles, spacecraft and space application that have accelerated social economic development in India to unprecedented levels. Today, among us, Professor Vikram Sarabhai is not there. Reverend Peter Bernard Pereira is not there. But those who are responsible for creation and making flowers to blossom will themselves be a different kind of flower as described in Bhagavad Gita, which says, see the flower, how generously it distributes the perfume and honey. It gives to all, gives freely of its love. When its work is done, it falls away quietly. Try to be like the flower, unassuming, despite all its qualities. What a beautiful message to the humanity on the purpose of life reflected of the spiritual component. Can we bridge? Can we bridge the spiritual component of the religion to bring peace to the nation and to the world? I have given you an example. I am trying to look at is there something happened anywhere in the world? If you are aware, you can send a mail to me, apj at the rate of abdulkalam.com. Now, friends, I would like to talk to unity of minds. I like to recall one incident which commonly occurs in many parts of my country. I have witnessed this event when I was a young boy, 10 years old, 1941, British India. In our house, periodically, I used to see three different unique personalities meet. Pachi Lachimna Shastrihal, who was the head priest of famous Rameswaran temple and a Vedic scholar. Reverend Father Bodal, who built the first church in Rameswaran Island, and my, and my father, who was the imam in the mosque. All the three of them used to sit and discuss the island's problems and find solution. In addition, they built several religious connectivities with compassion. These connectivities quietly spread to others in the island like a fragrance from the flowers. This sight always comes to my mind whenever I discuss with the people of, of dialogue of religions. Thought of, throughout the world, the need to have a frank dialogue among cultures, religions, 
civilization and is being felt now more than ever. These two instances, what I have narrated give me confidence that religion definitely can be bridged through spiritual components. We have to spread such glad tidings to every part of the world. Now friends, finally I will, now let us discuss the third important component of a enlightened society which is to achieve economic development for the societal transformation. For example, Indian economy is, is growing 6% per annum because of otherwise 9%, now last two years 6% per annum. We have to work for increasing this growth in the three sectors, agriculture, manufacturing and service sector. Our aim is 12th plan is to realize the target of 8.2 percent or more GDP. We have a mission of spreading this economic growth throughout the country through a program called PURA, providing urban amenities in the rural area, which envisages provision of physical, electronic knowledge connectivity leading to economic connect connectivity of all the 600,000 villages in the country. This will uplift the quality of life of 350 million people living below poverty line. The aim of the program is to empower the citizens with good quality of uh, life encompassing nutritious food, good habitat, clean environment, affordable health care, quality education and productive employment integrated with our value system drawn from civilization heritage leading to the comprehensive development of the nation that will bring smiles in one, in one billion plus people. Every nation can have its own vision for economic development. In conclusion, friends, I have seen three dreams which have taken shape as a vision, a mission and realization. Space program of, space program of Indian Space Research Organization, Agni program of a Defense Research, Research Development Organization, Pura providing urban amenities rural area becoming the national mission. Of course, these three programs succeeded in the midst of many challenges and problems. I have worked in all these three areas. I would like to convey to you all friends, particularly young friends, what they have learned on leadership from these three programs. Number one, leader must have a vision. He should be a visionary or she should be a visionary. Leader must have a passion and accomplish the mission. Leader must be able to travel into an unexplored path. Leader must know how to manage a success and failure. Leader must have courage to take decision. Leader should have nobility in management. Leader, every action of the leader should be transparent. Leader, most importantly, should work with integrity and succeed with integrity. I have been discussing these essential traits of creative leaders with people of eminence in different areas and students from India and abroad. Apart from this, what is needed is the spirit among the youth. That is, I can do it. We can do it, it will transform into we can do it and further it will transform into nation can do it. Our education institution have to concentrate on developing the leadership traits and the confidence to perform among every youth of the nation. This quality of leadership will certainly empower the nations of the world with suitable development, prosperity, peace as focus. I once again uh, thank the Carlton University for providing me an opportunity to address and interact with the student, faculty and Indo-Canadian community in this beautiful environment. My best wishes to the Han family uh, and all of you for success in all your mission. May God bless you all friends. Well, I was a professor and uh, I was teaching and doing research in southern part of India. One day, Prime Minister called me, there is a general view including opposition, you guys should become the president, okay. So I said uh, I need some time, uh, two hours to discuss and come back to you. So I went to my colleagues, academic colleagues, they said don't go politics like you said, <laughs> <laughs> don't go. But I had a mission. My mission was at that time we had a road map, uh, India 2020 vision, by the year 2020, India should be economically developed nation. That is, poverty of the people, 30 percent should be lifted up. I had a, uh, I had a, a road map with uh, proposals, with a document prepared by 500 experts, but I want to market it. I thought if I become the president of India, I will market it to the parliament, I will market it to the cabinet, I did it. 
But I want to tell you one thing. You can go to my website www.abdulkalam.com, click Networking of Rivers. There I have suggested that uh, internally every state should have a smart river, uh, river way, smart river way, uh, so that that would be continuously, uh, it would be dynamic and it would be economic, uh, economic and tourist uh, value it will have. So, I am pushing that idea. Definitely, I will like to get your thoughts on that by APJ at the rate of abdulkalam.com. If I give my thoughts, will you follow? <laughs> okay. Sir, one thing I want to tell you, every nation has got a law against corruption. And India is fighting to have a law, that uh, strong law, to put the people in the prisons. But naturally, prisons will get filled up, is it not? <laughs> so, is there any other solution? There only I come. The solution is, I have proposed what is called a, a happy family. Happy family. I have developed an equation. Happy family is equal to a spiritual house plus happy mother plus a father free from corruption plus a home, clean home, green home. Now, this is what I proposed. I have given the details. You want to know the details? You want to have the details? No. The uh, message is very clear. Okay, very good. That means, one message I want to give you, I feel a happy family emanates from a happy mother. These lot of young people are there, okay? Lot of young people are there. Will you, will you repeat with me if you don't mind? Will you repeat with me? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah? yes. Today onwards. Yes. Today onwards. Yes. You are not eaten three days. Today onwards. Yes. I will make, I will make. My, my, my mother happy. Yes. If my mother is happy, if my mother is happy, my home is happy. If my home is happy, society is happy. If society is happy, Canada will be happy. <laughs> well, sir, it is like this. I am still believe 2020 is possible. Even though last two years, our GDP, because of the world, uh, world problems, we also got sucked in. We brought down 6.9% GDP growth. I personally believe by next year, we'll go to 9% and we'll move 9 to 10%. Eight years more for India 2020. Of all resources, we have number of resources. One best resource we have, the young population. We have democratic young population of 600 million people. They are the reignited mind of the youth is the most powerful resource on the earth, above the earth, under the earth. So they will make it possible. They will make it possible. They will make it possible. Well, it's a good question. I am promoter of, uh, because I am a space fellow, promoter of uh, Earth, Moon, Mars as an economic complex. <laughs> because our population 7 billion, the world population, and it may go to 9 billion by another 10 to 15 years time. So, because water is found in the moon, and uh, the good news given by the, uh, the uh, discoverer. So, uh, so, I personally believe that uh, Earth Moon, Mars should be one single economic complex because people should move. You will bring the uh, material. And uh, this, is, this is the one general uh, information I want to give you because I am a promoter of this complex, economic complex. But to answer to your question, you know, I have found in India, we have wherever, whichever state, whichever province, we have the, the education as a primary area, education, 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 particularly women education, we found that uh, population automatically reduced, okay? So, uh, manageable size, education. Now, the recently government of India passed a bill in parliament which says up to age 15, all the boys and girls will have free and compulsory education. This compulsory education free definitely will bring the girls' education very, very high and the population automatically controlled. That is my feeling. Well, the FTI, case by case, we have to study to see what happens 
we produce 250 million tons of food agriculture. But uh, our farmers do not do the value addition, value addition. If FDI is going to help us, the value addition of the produce by the farmers, I will go with that. I, am, I, I, have, I have also informed openly, FDI in certain area, I am, go, I am for it. Okay. Very fantastic question, sir. But one thing I want to tell you, look at this light. This light, you know, just look at the light. When you see the light, you remember one great man, Thomas Alva Edison. When, they, when he started the bulb making and the electricity system wanted to make it, nobody believed it, nobody supported it, but he did it. Okay. Then the aircraft fly, right, brother, 1885, uh, the academician and professor uh, Kelvin said, nothing heavier than air can be flown. 1903, right, brothers, in, they flew. Okay. Then another person is, another person is, the whenever bell rings, you remember one person, Alexander Graham Bell. When he made a telephone, they said useless toy, they said useless toy. Today all of us proud to have each telephone. <laughs> similarly, similarly, I personally be against fossil fuel. For in my country, I am against fossil fuel because when you come to this place, you come in a car. Each car, you when you put a one gallon, one liter, one liter, you are generating two kilogram of carbon dioxide. The whole world makes uh, 36 gigaton carbon dioxide damaging the earth, damaging the earth. So I am going for, I am proposing my country energy independence. Energy independence means you go away from fossil fuel, go for solar power, a wind power, nuclear power, nuclear power, hydropower, and biofuel. All of them, all of them clean. Okay, I am pushing that. Nuclear power. I want to assure you, there are 546 nuclear reactors in the world. Okay, 546. Nearly one third of the power is generated by nuclear power. What is the biggest obstacle in in your games? Biggest obstacle. It cannot be done. The feeling of youth when they get a feeling it cannot be done is a dangerous trend. So. I am pushing an idea confident. I am confident. You want to hear that? You want to hear that? You must have youth. How many youth fellows are there? How many youth guys are there? How many youth guys are there? Okay. Some of them tend to become youth also. <laughs> okay. Now I am going to tell you how the one poem, it is written in the 13th century becomes so popular. I have modified the poem to suit the occasion to the young people. It is like this. The it is called I will fly. Name of the poem is I will fly. Now my friend is trying to locate where it is. <laughs> Good success for him. <laughs> it, it is, he has found out. Yes. This is, I will fly. Will you repeat? If young, young minds can repeat. Will you repeat? I am born with potential. I am born with goodness and trust. I am born with ideas and dreams. I am born with greatness. I am born with confidence. I am born with wings. So, so, I am not meant for crawling because I have wings. I will fly. I fly. I fly. That is the answer for you.